Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our talk on attacking next-gen uh, roaming technologies. The pieces you see on the, on the slide are not exactly next-gen, but I encourage you to find out uh, what these pieces are. Uh, in any case, my name is Enno, uh, this is Daniel. Hello. We are both security researchers for a German uh, security assessment and uh, research company called ERNW. I'm acting as a replacement speaker for Hendrik, who's the uh, telco team um, lead at ERNW. He had a nasty car accident um, on Monday. He's mostly better than Bruce, uh, so uh, nothing really serious happened, but it was a kind of, um, they, they helped uh, his girlfriend and him at another accident at the side of the road, and another car crashed into the group. So it was quite nasty, and it's the reason why he can't be here today. Um, I have a background uh, also, like Hendrik, in um, large-scale network environments and uh, telco security, so I hope I will be able to fulfill or uh, to fill the um, uh, Hendrik's role here. Uh, Daniel and I have given a number of talks at Black Hat in the last 10 years on stuff like MPLS security, uh, Cisco VoIP security, stuff like this. So this gives you an indication of the type of stuff we usually do. And today we are going to cover uh, uh, briefly as a seven and diameter. Actually, the, the agenda of the talk is quite simple. Uh, we want to give a brief technology overview, uh, namely of this thing called uh, diameter and the role it has in uh, telco networks, uh, namely in the context of roaming, when people from, uh, who have a subscription in one provider's network uh, are physically located in another provider's network and establish calls or establish uh, data connections as well. Uh, then we'll discuss uh, what types of attacks exist in these environments, especially related to the, uh, to the protocols we cover. There will be a tool release, it's Black Hat time. So um, there will be a new tool that uh, Daniel wrote and he's going to, uh, to show. And obviously we'll try to derive some conclusions what this means as for security in telco networks in general and in particular when it comes to diameter. Let's start with a quick view what has been uh, available in telco networks for the signaling uh, between providers so far. That is, uh, there is one main, say, protocol or um, protocol suite uh, called SS7, signaling seven, uh, system seven. Uh, that one is used um, for, say, uh, signaling between providers when it comes to authentication of subscribers in roaming scenarios, when it comes to exchange of information about these subscribers. And uh, the most simple situation uh, when you're a, a telco subscriber is, uh, say, we have Alice and Bob. Um, Alice is subscriber in provider A's network and Bob is in provider B's network. Um, this is not what we are going to cover in detail. The thing we are going to look at is the roaming situation when Alice actually is in another provider's network. And then what happens is a specific type of interaction between the provider where Alice is physically located and attaches to the network. Uh, and her, as it's it called, uh, home provider, which holds the uh, authentication information when it comes to Alice, which uh, holds all the information as for the, the contract and the subscription and as for the charging. And uh, this um, type of interaction in the uh, until 4G, this type of interaction, which is about retrieve authentication information, get the encryption material, get all types of information about the subscription, and updating uh, the, the location of the, of the subscriber. Like, okay, now uh, Alice is located uh, in some, some remote country in another provider's network. All these interactions uh, in the past have happened uh, through SS7. SS7, there has been quite some security research uh, on it, uh, a number of uh, talks were given, namely at the, at the CCC uh, event. Um, there were some papers, some blog posts uh, from some guys, so we can consider it to some degree well researched. And um, there is even, funny enough, from, from Sense, which um, from my perspective uh, don't exactly have a reputation of uh, being experts in telco security, but there is a, a very good paper from one guy 
um, in, the, in the sense context, which did a kind of vulnerability classification. And the classification of uh, the types of exchanges uh, used within SS7, like, okay, there are some, some exchanges, some messages which are only meant to be transported between uh, providers. There are some which are meant to be uh, used within one provider, but do, do not necessarily have to be exposed uh, to the outside uh, world in a, in a roaming exchange uh, to other providers. Uh, so there is this classification, and in that paper there is a, a classification of, uh, say, these categories and uh, types of exchanges within SS7, and um, uh, the attacks related, which uh, can occur in the context of uh, specific messages. Uh, I'm mostly telling this to, to make you aware there has been some uh, research and there is already uh, some understanding what uh, types of issues can arise from SS7 and um, how these uh, can be mapped uh, to uh, exchanges and um, uh, what actually happens between uh, different providers. Uh, there is a tool. Yeah, um, as for SS7, I did implement most of the attacks last year and released the tool as for t to test your network for those uh, well-known attacks on SS7 networks. And it's already released. Uh, I wrote a nice um, article on Insinuator about the tool. Um, it's very useful to check uh, if you as a telco yourself are vulnerable to those attacks. Um, but anyways, you will need a legitimate SS7 uplink to use that tool properly. Which actually is a quite heavy restriction when it comes to doing security research, uh, needing this type of uplink, as you can't like uh, do this, uh, even if you have the tool and you get the tool running, or other tools, but I, I would say this is the most um, important one. Um, you can't do this from home. You need this, uh, say, type of access to that mostly close or as, say, as it's called in telco space, a walled garden where the telcos interact. Uh, we will see this, is, uh, this might be slightly different with Diameter. Uh, as, for, um, as for the tool itself. Yeah, this is uh, what the tool looks like. So um, as said before, it implements various um, well-known attacks and just test for those um, attacks with like uh, the send routing information for short messages, or if you could resolve an MS ISDN into an IMC via the send IMC message, and so forth and so on. So this is what a typical um, test output would look like. But we're not here to talk about SS7. We are here to talk about uh, the, the newer stuff, which is used in 4G networks. Uh, some. Uh, um, say important properties of 4G networks here is uh, everything is based on IP. There is not this uh, strict separation between an IP-based, uh, say, data transport and a, a circuit-switched uh, voice thing as we had in uh, 2G and 3G. In 4G, it's all IP. It's somewhat logically separated. There is still a, a data channel and a, and a voice channel um, implemented by so-called uh, bearers on the, on the, on the smartphones uh, or on the phone side. Uh, uh, the, the phone um, and, and some of the slides will be called the uh, UE, the, say the user entity or the user equipment. And um, the role that so far SS7 had for the signaling between uh, providers, uh, namely in the roaming uh, context, uh, this is nowadays done by Diameter. Uh, Diameter uh, has, uh, say there's different entities and parties involved in the specification of Diameter. There is a thing called the base protocol, which Daniel is going to be discussing in a second. Uh, that one is specified from the IETF space in an RFC. But uh, given that Diameter originally comes from the telco world, the 3GPP, which is the main specification body uh, for, for telco technologies, um, uh, has a number of their own specifications which mainly describe uh, so-called applications. Uh, initially, uh, Diameter, as the name might indicate, was meant as a, a, replay, or as a successor of radios. So mostly used for AAA, authentication, authorization purposes and accounting. Um, and there is this, this wordplay, they try to come up with something which gives the abbreviation uh, diameter. Uh, 
uh, as uh, opposed to, to radios. But nowadays, diameter is used as a multi-purpose signaling protocol for all types of interactions uh, between providers. And the thing is, it's not just uh, like a protocol for the exchange and for certain messages. Um, again, those will be discussed in a second. But it has a kind of own routing logic. So entities participating or speaking diameter uh, have, a, say, a, an own layer of how to forward messages to other nodes and how to, how to find each other and how to talk to each other. Uh, this will become important um, at some later point. And another thing that to keep in mind is that um, diameter uh, can be, uh, say, uh, transported above uh, or over TCP. But most uh, cases that we know, um, I, I don't think we have ever seen diameter um, over TCP. No, not, not in production anyway. Um, uh, in telco world, it's very common to use SCTP, the stream um, the transmission control protocol, as, as the uh, layer 4 protocol. Uh, so usually uh, you see a diameter being uh, spoken and implemented um, over SCTP. And uh, now looking at the roaming scenario in the 4G, in the so-called next-gen uh, world, there is um, several things to keep in mind. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a separation between uh, uh, data and voice, and there is the uh, signaling, the out-of-band thing, uh, for setting up the call and for uh, getting subscriber information. All these channels, while it's logically separate, uh, uh, from the transport level implemented across uh, points where the providers meet. Uh, those points in the old world, uh, the, those were called the GRXs, and now they are called the IPXs, and most uh, large telcos offer this type of service. Uh, you can, um, like, uh, say, uh, um, just an exchange network for uh, specific things between uh, providers. When it comes to uh, voice transport in 4G networks. Uh, that is usually done um, by means of uh, voice over LTE, VoLTE. And uh, uh, technically speaking, uh, there is, uh, um, next to the data channel, which exists anyway, and which is IP-based, uh, there is uh, a second channel, a second bearer for the voice transport, which is realized over IP. And the main component involved on the on the, in, the, in the telco infrastructure is the so-called IMS, the IP multimedia subsystem. And when you look at this, uh, there is three main things uh, from the, the telco world has all types of components with specific names, with specific abbreviations. Uh, there's three that are of importance for what we are going to discuss. Uh, there is one entity called the HSS, uh, the Home Subscriber Server. This is the central database for authentication and for all types of data related to an individual subscriber. Uh, then there is the MME, which is the Mobility Management Entity. Uh, that is the kind of, uh, say, component uh, doing all the control pane for actual um, user uh, subscriber connections. So that uh, component that terminates or has the, has the data, okay, in this cell there is that uh, subscriber uh, attached to the network and um, uh, handling the, the, the connection and the call data, including handling the keys which are used for the over-the-air encryption. And then there is the IMS, the IP Multimedia Subsystem, which uh, kind of terminates and handles the uh, voice over LTE, so the, the user plane. The MME is uh, the so-called control, uh, control plane, and the uh, IMS uh, implements a user plane. And there is two scenarios which are relevant for, for our discussion. Um, say, imagine Alice is roaming, and Alice is in provider C's network. And now uh, Alice establishes a, a voice over LTE call, which is protocol-wise handled by um, um, RTP and, and, and ZIP. Uh, the thing is, uh, this uh, connection actually can be, uh, can be encrypted uh, between, the, uh, between Alice and the IMS. And uh, one case is the IMS sits in, the, in Alice home network. Then this is called the home routed IMS. And uh, the other case is that the foreign provider, where actually Alice is uh, physically located, 
uh, has an own IMS uh, terminating the the uh, SIP um, uh, connections with uh, with LS, and then somewhat uh, hands it over, depending on where LS actually wants to wants to uh, talk to uh, to the to the home IMS uh, via a so-called NNI network to network interface. Uh, this scenario means that in case uh, the connection is encrypted, uh, which obviously from a security and privacy perspective makes sense, uh, but which isn't, uh, I wouldn't say it's, uh, that all providers actually encrypt their uh, voice over uh, LTE um, connections. We did some security testing in one provider's network uh, some time ago. And it was not, it was, the whole thing was unencrypted. And they told us, well, for the purpose of your testing, we disabled it, but uh, trust us, uh, it's uh, usually it's enabled, but it just has been turned off for the testing. Uh, derive your conclusions. In any case, uh, in this scenario, the foreign provider uh, entity might be involved in the uh, encrypted channel of LS, which, say, depending on uh, lawful interception requests or stuff, might be in the very interest of the foreign provider. Uh, but um, uh, from those two, say, architectures, uh, this one is much more prevalent. All this is still a bit, uh, well, uh, TE is uh, still a bit uh, in the beginning in, in uh, mobile networks. So uh, this is more prevalent, but from, uh, say, uh, uh, certain entities' perspective, this might be much more interesting uh, for uh, say lawful interception and stuff. So we will see this uh, in, at some point, uh, probably. This is what we expect. Uh, in between those components in the telco world, with all, which all have their uh, specific names, there is types of interactions. And these interactions are bound to so-called interfaces. Those interfaces don't have to be, but uh, in, in some cases are, actually separate uh, physical interfaces. It's uh, more or less about uh, logical structuring. Once uh, this component talks to this one, uh, let's call this uh, the interface used. Uh, let's give this a specific name as opposed to another interchange between components. And the one that is of most interest for us is called S6A. Uh, that's the one that is used between the MME and the HSS. And the MME in a roaming scenario is located in a foreign provider's network. That's the one taking actual care of the, the setup of the call. But this MME has to talk to a home provider's HSS so to find out, is this a, a, a valid user? Uh, what about the charging? And so on. Um, yeah. So um, as for the base diameter protocol used and specified in the RFC, um, the diameter header looks much like this. So you, you got a, a version of the length and some flags. but. Uh, very interesting and important here is the so-called application ID. The application ID determines um, which, on which interface for once this diameter message is used on, and also it targets a specific yeah, application on the receiving side. So you might have an application for S6A, the roaming interface, um, which then again supports um, specific commands. So you also got the field command code here um, so that on, on the targeted application you can execute different commands like um, please hand me over this phone's crypto keys or please register this phone now as available in my network. Um, then you will find in the base protocol the two fields, the two identifier, the so-called hop by hop and end to end identifier which will play an important role in the whole diameter routing scenario. So um, the end-to-end -end identifier is used to determine both endpoints of a diameter routed message. So that um, a message that is received on one side can find it, its path back to the, um, to the other side, so the answer to that message. And the hop-by-hop -hop identifier then is used uh, also in diameter routing, but between different diameter routers. So they, each diameter router on the way of a message sets up like a, a small routing entry for that specific um, path the message takes and registers the hop-by-hop -hop and end-to-end -end identifier. And with this table, it can look up the path 
back for the answer message. This will play an important role because uh, what this implies is, is that we don't need any more information. We do not need any IP addresses. We do not need any host names or so forth to uh, receive an answer to any diameter message we will send out. So after this common diameter header, there are um, some AVPs, um, which are just um, fields that can be used, that can be attached to your message, and they will be used in, in, uh, in regards to the application you target and the commands you will execute. OK, so um, just to show you what one of these diameter messages looks in Wireshark, um, this is one of the most basic ones. It's just a uh, device watchdog request. Um, which uses the application ID zero. This, is all, this application also is specified by the RFC. And it's just to, uh, this message will be sent out frequently just to check if the other peer is still available or not. Um, you see the both identifiers in here, as this is a, a handcrafted example message. Um, they're just uh, very nice to remember numbers. Uh, and also, you see two AVPs included here. Those two AVPs you will find in every diameter message. It's the origin host and the origin realm. So this more or less says, um, identifies the sender of this message. You see both of these fields have an, uh, have an host name like content. Um, the format of this host name is very well defined, so it always ends with uh, EPC evolve packet core dot mobile network code dot mobile country code dot three GPP networks dot com uh, dot org. I'm sorry. Um, the host name in the beginning, the provider can choose for its own, but yeah, most of the time they're not very complex. It, it will be like HSS or MME one, MME two, and so forth. OK, also you got the origin realm, which is more or less just the, the, the last part of the uh, origin host. So this just says um, this message origins from this network. OK, so, so far for the basic diameter message. Um, as we mainly focused on the S6A roaming interface, <laughs> Um, we read the specification, and it turns out there is a limited number of uh, messages speci specified for this application. Um, they're all used in the roaming context, and some of them expose some quite sensitive data. Like, for example, the authentication information request will give you uh, all the crypto keys and um, authentication information for a SIM card. Um, so we focused on all, uh, mainly on this set of messages, and just to show you one example of those, the, uh, I just talked about the authentication information request. This is what you see here. So it also has the, the common um, diameter header in front. You see the targeted application is S6A, and it has quite a lot of AVPs attached to it. So you see this one has different AVPs that the message before. For once, it has a session ID. Um, very important, so the receiving host can determine different sessions uh, originating from your diameter host. Then it has some user data, like the username it wants to receive authentication information for. This is just an MC. And also there are some other values like the visited PLMN ID, uh, which in fact signals from which network the, um, or to which network the uh, UE wants to attach to. And then you will find again the origin host, origin realm, and a destination realm. Notice that there in there is no destination host entry. Because, yeah, maybe me as a foreign um, telco network, I do not know the host name of, uh, of the HSS I want to contact. 
I just want to know I need to attach to this network. The phone wants to attach to uh, MCC 262, MNC 01. So how do I know which H HSS to contact? I do not know. So I will just throw out a diameter message targeting a destination realm. So I just want to reach the evolved packet core of MNC uh, 01, MCC uh, 26. Two in this case. Yeah. Um, okay, so I do not need a host name. I just throw out a diameter message, and through diameter routing, this message will magically find its way to the right destination host. Amazing, isn't it? Okay, we will come back to this uh, nice routing feature later. Um, but for now, we should just take a moment and think about attacks we can derive from maybe SS7. So when looking at diameter, especially uh, when compar comparing it uh, to SS7, uh, given diameter is the uh, successor of SS7 uh, when it comes to the, uh, to the main signaling functions, uh, most of the say attacks which have been possible in SS7 provided you had the right position in the network, uh, uh, have an equivalent in the diameter world. Uh, you might have noticed when Daniel showed the, uh, uh, the, the Wireshark uh, screams, uh, there, there wasn't really something um, on authentication. Actually, diameter can be authenticated by means of certificates, but uh, those of you who are familiar with certificates and their operational implications might have an idea how much this is used. Actually, it's not used that much, to uh, put it politely. Uh, so um, there is no built-in authentication. There is some uh, reliance on um, the two things, uh, as, as will turn out. Um, some checking of the so-called host origin, and uh, maybe, as Daniel mentioned, uh, a certain sense of, uh, say, uh, hiding uh, functions, uh, not exposing host names or things like that. In any case, from an abstract perspective, um, most of the problems which have existed in uh, SS7 before still exist to mostly the same degree in uh, diameter. And there might be even new problems um, during security testing in uh, different uh, telco environments. We identified, uh, it's a relatively new technology, so you can identify uh, implementation flaws, you can identify uh, errors in the way how, say, specifications were um, uh, transmitted into specific um, implementations. So there is even even newer stuff, but let's focus on the, on the uh, old stuff first. In SS7, depending on the security objectives one has in mind, uh, from a subscriber's perspective, uh, the privacy of, where the, of the subscriber's location uh, is a quite, uh, quite important objective. Uh, that one, um, uh, say in SS7, it was possible to track subscribers, the same as possible in, uh, with uh, diameter as well by means of a specific uh, message, the IDR. The, um, the R is a request, uh, the is... Data, insert data subscriber and, data request. Yeah. Okay, um, using this message uh, one can still uh, pull um, or uh, try to get hold of the, uh, the actual cell ID where a specific subscriber is uh, located. Interception. Uh, that, that might be actually a bit more difficult, as uh, one has to keep in mind diameter is just uh, used for the control plane, for the signaling. There is no actual data transport across diameter. So even if one manages to, say, to interfere with diameter, this doesn't mean one is able to interfere with the actual voice and message traffic of a specific uh, user. To do so, one uh, would still need, uh, say, a, a local a fake base station uh, attack type uh, to get hold of the traffic. And then, um, as the, uh, the, the voice traffic is, um, uh, there is encryption over the, uh, over the air interface, one has to get hold of the uh, key material of this specific uh, SIM card. 
identified by the IMSI, and uh, the HG HSS holding this, which then can be accessed uh, through, through diameter, potentially. Uh, so uh, two things have to be combined. Uh, this might be particularly interesting in, uh, when you recall, this uh, home IMS versus the local breakout IMS scenario. Uh, once um, uh, key material is used uh, for, um, or is reused for the encryption of the uh, actual uh, RTP traffic for the, for the voice over IP, over LTE uh, connection from, um, it might be very interesting for somebody who wants to get uh, the actual content of a communication uh, to get hold of this uh, key material, which is where the, uh, the difference comes into play. Uh, does it terminate in the home network, or does, uh, say, the um, uh, RTP and, and, and ZIP thing happen in the, in the remote network? From, a, from a, again, lawful interception perspective, uh, the second might be much more interesting for a specific, for certain countries. Yeah. Uh, also, if, if you do the, the local breakout scenario for, for voice over IP roaming, you would need to expose more diameter applications to the IPX interface. So from that perspective, you would just widen your attack surface. Uh, from, a, from an operator's perspective, one of the main risks is uh, 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 billing fraud. A diameter might come into play here. We played around with this, but we weren't actually uh, able to, uh, to come up with, um, with working attacks. Uh, but um, let's say it's, it's, uh, there are some similarities to, uh, to SS7 namely when it comes to the so-called uh, charging profiles of subscribers. Denial of service of various kinds might be possible once one is able to interfere with diameter. First, one can easily, uh, say, modify the information where a, a UE, a specific um, phone, is located, so that phone wouldn't get any, any data or calls any longer. Uh, this is focused on the phone, and uh, once one can uh, talk diameter to, to components, uh, one can come up with uh, sending malformed messages and all this. We did some testing here, but uh, the uh, specific uh, telco environments where we were working on this uh, were very uh, cautious when it came to, well, you guys sending malformed packages, even in, uh, in test environments, um, uh, this wasn't very welcome. But there will be some functionality in the tool, which you will see in a, in a second. The main limitation from a, say, attacker's perspective is that uh, within Diameter there is the concept of this host origin, like who is the actual originator of, uh, of a specific type of message, which was uh, within the, uh, the header of the Diameter messages. And components involved in these exchanges can actually check, does a specific message come from a uh, from a legitimate kind of uh, counterpart in the sense of like an, an HSS, uh, this central user authentication database uh, receiving uh, a diameter message might check, oh, does this really come from an MME? As is usually over the so-called interface S6A, it's supposed to talk to MMEs uh, in uh, either the local or foreign uh, networks. Uh, but, so there is this kind of uh, checking um, I, would, I wouldn't really call it authentication, but uh, say identification. The uh, point is um, uh, this, this value can easily be set uh, on, and overridden by, the, uh, say, by an attacker. So this does, uh, depending on the way how it's implemented, it might not really help. Um, and there is not much checking on this uh, from our experience anyway. As, um, uh, the whole diameter thing, uh, especially happening between different providers and happening through an IPX, is complex in itself, and the most uh, and a number of people we know don't really like to touch it. Like, well, this might break something. Uh, let's leave it as is. Um, so th there is not much checking on the on the host origin from our experience. In summary, before going to the more like practical part, uh, doing the same exercise as was done for SS7. We can kind of map, say, specific message types to uh, specific attack types, and uh, this table gives an indication which messages might be particularly interesting when being sent to a specific entity. 
um, there was some. Uh, there, there was one, for example, for in the in the in the DOS um, space. Uh, uh, down at the in the table, there's a DSR message, which is a kind of reset, or which an HSS can send to the MME, like, oh, I'm undergoing a. Uh, say a reboot, uh, please dear MME, MME cancel all uh, active uh, connections. So if one would be able to uh, say spoof and inject that one, obviously it could cause uh, significant um, harm, to, uh, to say the least. And uh, so now on the more practical part. Yeah, so uh, what we've seen is that the originating host, especially the MME host names are kind of kept the only secret within the diameter communication. So if I know the MME's host name and UE is attached to, I can just use that host name and inject messages like, um, like I can drop that UE, I can uh, modify um, some, some forwarding data of that UE and so forth. So the, the host name is, is a very um, important part in this role and that's why um, a lot of people in the diameter world talk about topology and topology hiding. Uh, what's meant by this is that, as I showed before, you do not um, expose host names at all. So you don't have to file um, uh, like like um, you have you had to in SS7 you had to file a page which uh, specifies all your components with their global title. You do not have such a thing in Diameter. If you want to reach a certain application, you just target the um, destination origin. You do not target hosts in particular. The rest is taken care of by Diameter routing. Diameter routing knows okay you wanted to target S6A with function X, I need to route that message over there. Um, so that's why you do not need to expose your host names and why a lot of people try to keep the host names, especially the MME host names, secret. And there is also a technical feature called topology hiding, which is a component um, right at your diameter border to the IPX, which randomizes host names incoming and outgoing, um, which by the way, I do not think is a, uh, is a good thing to do because, you know, you need to keep state tables and with long host name entries and state tables used to overflow and uh, just saying. So, um, like, a lot of people wanted to keep their host names secret, but there are ways to leak certain host names. I did not find one for an attached MME uh, right now, but you can, like, leak host names of HSS really easily. Um, yeah, also most of the time those host names um, follow a certain naming scheme. So if you can guess them, you're also good. Um, yeah, of course, host name spoofing, um, pretty easy. You can just put into the origin host whatever you like. There is no checking of this value ever. Mm. I can also, um, when I'm talking to you via IPX, I can spoof your internal hosts. So if you do not have any fancying, uh, fancy diameter routing rules, uh, the message will just reach a target. The target has no chance to determine me from the legitimate originating host and will just accept the message. And also, I will get the answer back, not the real host, because we have those fancy hop by hop and end to end um, identifiers. So that's, that's really comfortable. Spoofing in diameter is very nice. Okay, um, what you could do to prevent um, the, the bad attacks here is just cross-checking values within the diameter messages. Like, there is this PLMN idea I showed you before. Maybe you also struggled while I was reading out the uh, destination host because the PLMN ID and the destination host name did not match. They were targeting different uh, mobile country codes. So you could cross-check those values to make sure uh, a message is legitimate. And also, if you keep state of your phones, so if you know a phone is attached to a certain network, and suddenly an, a different network asks for information about that phone already attached 
to your network, you can just drop the message. But that's quite complicated because you need to keep track of the state of UEs. <coughs> okay, so I did write a tool for all of this we were talking about. It's called Dimeter Enum. Um, it's written in Python this time, which is way more easy than dealing with, with the SS7 stuff. Um, it's built around libdimeter, which I took from PyProtosim. Um, kudos. Um, it will be released under the BSD license. And yeah, it's used to send out diameter messages to a DRA, to a diameter router. So what you will need is a diameter router to send your messages to. Um, and the best way this diameter router also is, has some path to IPX and if it has, you will be able to reach any diameter node out there. So yes, this tool, um, as the SS7 mapper, implements um, probe packages for the, at least the attacks we have discovered. Also, I tried to implement probe messages for every um, defined diameter message out there. I'm not quite finished, but I'm, I'm going there. And um, the tool is mainly used to check your own diameter setup, to check your diameter routing setup, and your, if you have one diameter firewall, if there is any configuration issue um, or which functionality is exposed to IPX. Um, the tool also, also features a diameter application scanner, which I will show in a second. So you can, um, for once, determine which application is exposed on a given host name. And secondly, you can figure out if you're leaving the destination host out, you can just um, enumerate applications, let diameter routing do its magic, and get answering host names back. So you can map the, the internal topology. Okay, the tool can be downloaded here in about 30 minutes, and it will also be released on GitHub soon. Take your photos. Okay, um, it, um, it needs a configuration file, so I do not overflow the command line with, with arguments. Uh, because you need to specify quite a few values like the origin host and origin realm you want to use, the destination host and destination realm you want it to target. Um, also for the ease of use, you will specify your outgoing IP address in here. Um, you have some like values like the product name to include in the diameter messages. Um, this could be very helpful if you want to um, to, to sort out the, the messages like out of your log files afterwards to see, yes, that was the testing, that was not a real attack. And for the 3GPP world, you need to specify um, a whole bunch of messages in here like your fake mobile network code, your fake mobile country code, the IMC you're targeting with some messages, um, the PLM and ID you want to use in there and so forth and so on. Okay, so let's go on to it. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the real stuff as I do not have a link to IPX here. So that's why I need to do my demo locally and it will not be that astonishing. So my local setup is I have a free diameter running on my notebook. This free diameter exposes some applications and also um, exposes some functionality on these applications. So now I just want to check, um, oh, I can show you the configuration file, which is just this. So I have there um, my origin host and realm, destination host and realm. I have the IP address I'm using and so forth. Also, you can specify different values for different interfaces you're testing, but I'm, I'll not use that in the demo. Okay, so now I want to know which applications are exposed 
by my local diameter host. And I'm just doing an initial um, capability exchange. That one is printed, so you will see um, all the IP addresses the host is exposing. Um, in this case, as free diameter is very, very um, talky, it also gives you the application it exposes, but this value does not need to, uh, to match the real applications exposed. And afterwards, I just enumerate over all the application IDs and look if they're, oh, I'm using an invalid command ID. So uh, if the application is reachable, it will answer with an error code command unsupported. But that tells me, okay, the application is available. Otherwise, I would get back an application un uh, unavailable or a an, um, routing lookup mismatch. So I'm doing the scanning once with an explicit destination host, so targeting one host, seeing what applications are exposed there. And the second time, I do it without a destination host. So I'm just giving a destination realm which means magic diameter routing uh, is taking place, and you, will, you might get back answers from different hosts and also see different ap applications. <coughs> okay, so once I know which applications are exposed, I can then just start the command enumeration which will go through every implemented command and try to deliver them. And we will see like, okay, I have an accounting application running. So the accounting request will succeed. I now know this is a functionality exposed by the diameter host. Um, also, the uh, authentication information request we have seen in the example before is not exposed. So that's a good thing. And going through all these messages, you could check um, if your diameter routing is correct, if your exposure to IPX is the, has the least footprint it needs to have. And yeah, you could play some other nasty tricks like um, uh, spoofing your origin host or origin realm. And yeah, let's say it like this with a with a bit of config tuning, you can use the tool to, to perform most of the attacks we talked about. Okay. So um, before we go onto that slide, um, yes. uh, a quick comment. At this point, you might ask, um, or some of you might actually recall very early talks from Daniel and, and I when we at, had at this point like a slide, okay, there are so many exposed uh, hosts in the internet. Uh, here are some numbers. Uh, here are some geographical distribution of those. Uh, this part is missing here uh, for a reason. Uh, nowadays, we consider it uh, within ERW at least debatable, if not unethical, to do a large-scale uh, internet scanning for the simple reason that you touch other systems, uh, other, other people's systems without uh, usually being authorized to do so. So uh, research projects within EMW, which include this part of scanning, have to go for the uh, internal ethics committee, and this effort wasn't undertaken here. So I don't have numbers for you, but uh, uh, I'd like to let you know, uh, I mean, um, a diameter is, it's all IP, it's, uh, Port uh, 3868, it might be implemented over SCTP, so your favorite scanning tool might not work. It's just uh, we don't do the scanning for you. Um, and you might come up with like, oh, uh, why not just uh, ask Shodan? Uh, well, then it's uh, delegating the, uh, the dirty, from our perspective, unethical work to somebody else, which doesn't make it better. So no numbers at this point. Um, feel free to uh, drive your, uh, derive your own uh, conclusions. Again, it's IP, uh, it has a well-known port, so you might be able to identify uh, systems, and of course you would only do so uh, once you're authorized to do, uh, to do it in your own, uh, say, environment and your own engagement context. Uh, that's that. 
Um, interestingly enough, uh, four weeks ago, the GSMA, the GSM Association, which is a kind of association of um, mobile network uh, operators, uh, they released uh, a document called Guidelines for Independent, <laughs> uh, Independent Remote Security Testing. Or that's a thing I was somewhat referring to uh, uh, two minutes ago. Uh, remote security testing, um, it uh, has a section on responsibilities of testers which I think is very important, um, uh, especially given uh, there is more research nowadays on, on stuff like this, and the operators are a bit concerned that uh, this research might lead to negative impact on the availability of core systems. Um, the thing is, uh, this document mostly focuses on SS7, but has some diameter content in it as well. And um, the tool, uh, the diameter enum, pretty much uh, does uh, a, a number of things that uh, the GSMA uh, guideline actually recommends operators doing. So if there are people from operators in the room, uh, you can use diameter enum to do specifically what is uh, recommended in this document. Um, this document has a lot of uh, content on, on different topics. I will skip this in the interest of time. And uh, let's discuss uh, very briefly, uh, say what this means, as, uh, or which, which type of recommendations or advice we have uh, for operators, uh, given, uh, well, Dimeta is not exactly new, but it's somewhat, uh, there is not like 20 years operational experience and uh, with Dimeta. There is a number of, say, dynamic factors in it. There is its own routing. Uh, there is all the, say, uh, requirements which derive from uh, doing, uh, from offering um, IP-based, packet-based services uh, in, a, in a global, uh, say, in a global setting. So the first and, and, and foremost advice from our perspective would be try to understand uh, this world of, of diameter applications, which components actually offer, which type of applications, which messages they need, uh, what this might mean from a security perspective. Understandably, the security objectives of a, subscri uh, of a subscriber might be different from the one from an operator. But um, try to understand the, the picture and what this means. Establish visibility in the sense of once, as Daniel mentioned, once a UE is attached to a specific network and there is diameter messages turning up concerning this UE from a different network, obviously this should raise suspicion. And there is a number of other things, message types which are not intended to be processed by specific uh, applications, and actually you see this stuff. Not much of it, but uh, once you look closely, uh, you can see uh, stuff like this happening in, in some of the um, uh, operator networks we have, been, we have been working on. So first and foremost, establish visibility, monitor for, for known attacks, monitor for specific message types, and once you have a clear understanding, we suggest uh, thinking about is there anything you, you can do on the relationship between the origin host, where does the message come from, and what does the message actually intend to, uh, to achieve or to perform? Uh, like uh, there is stuff coming in on the, on, uh, from an IPX, from one of these exchange networks. When it enters your own uh, network, your own, own realm, uh, and has an origin host in it, which doesn't belong to your network, obviously something is wrong. So this, on a very basic uh, and high-level perspective, what, uh, would be what we want to give as, as advice for, for those of you involved in uh, operator networks. Which brings us to the conclusions. Um, as a seven vulnerabilities, or, well, yeah, let's, let's call them vulnerabilities. Uh, aspects of signaling which can lead to unintended outcome. Uh, this type of things uh, continue to exist uh, with Diameter, as uh, Diameter, as the successor, implements uh, the same functions. Uh, Diameter, uh, the more um, VoLTE deployments one sees, uh, the more 4G is used, uh, the more important Diameter becomes. So it's growing and, and it's important. And uh, that's why we think it's helpful to be able to, to perform security research on it, which is the reason why uh, diameter enum was written and um, 
uh, is, is released today. Uh, before you ask, uh, some of you might know us and we have a reputation, uh, uh, Daniel and I, of uh, doing uh, fuzzing uh, of network protocols. Um, actually, there's a number of old talks uh, on, from us on, on fuzzing uh, all types of protocols. Uh, Daniel has developed an own fuzzing uh, say framework called Dizzy. So you might ask, uh, did, is there already fuzzing, fuzzing um, functionality in diameter enum? Not yet, but uh, I think there will be at some point. Uh, you might uh, um, say follow uh, what's happening on insinuator on the block or when it comes to diameter and diameter enum. That's it from our side. Thank you for your time. And I think we have uh, like 10 minutes for, for Q&A, five. Okay, there was a question over there. Do you need the mic? Yeah, yeah there is uh, actually um, somebody is uh, coming. It's about three miles away. <laughs> Hi, very cool and interesting topics. Um, question. First of all, that local environment you were showing before in the demo is yeah. kind of available somehow, will be available? Yeah, it's, because it's, it's a free diameter instance. Cool. Just Google free diameter and you will find it. You cool. will struggle a bit with the setup, but it's I doable. kind of use with Delco for, stuff, but yeah. For the SS7 mapper, at some point we release a... Uh, uh, is there a Docker image? Or a VM? In, yes, but not with a testing environment. Yeah. But uh, at some point, uh, there might be like a full-blown, cool. um, uh, given uh, with the other tool as a seven mapper, uh, uh, I would say 80% of the comments on the blog are like, oh, I have this problem setting it up. Uh, can you help me on that? Um, yeah, uh, there any, might be something. Anyone right that now, uh, but all the stuff is available. You cool. can impl implement it on your own. Cool, thanks. Second question is uh, a bit sort of compliant. Uh, as I noticed now, in 2017, SS7 and all the other new technologies like for GLTE uh, technology are still vulnerable. Now comes to uh, comes to me a question. Uh, GSM, if we go back on 2G, 2G is like 30 years old. 1987 was the developed the first uh, version of the spec, so it's 30 years old right now. And from 2G until LTE, we face many vulnerabilities. One thing that came up uh, to my mind was A52. That the stream cipher uh, that was weakened on purpose to de be delivered and installed on networks that were non NATO countries. So that was sort of uh, like pushed by governments, this weak weakened uh, algorithm. So now my idea is after 30 years of known vulnerabilities, how is possible that three GPP organization or GSMA organization? Uh, was unable to design proper safe protocols or if they tried to design because you know failing is possible still possible so who is the fault mainly free gpp organization gsma organiza organization or telco engineers please telco engineers here don't, don't be angry at me uh, or telco engineers failing on you know, applying proper, you know, de deploying proper networks. Like, for example, you mentioned certificates. I'm pretty sure that not many net mobile network operators are using, you know, the, 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 the highest uh, defined uh, solutions, security solutions for one type of protocol or interface. So if it's not free GPP or tech engineers, are Government states that are doing the same thing of A52, so pushing for keeping weak. I, I, don't, I don't think it's it's the fault okay. of governments because they have lawful interception anyways. Yeah, true. So they already have have the possibility to to get in there to get all the data they need. True. I think if you want to blame anyone or anything, you should blame the complexity of the technology. Okay. Okay. The, the thing is, in, in theory, most of the standards, and I mean for uh, A52, there's A53. In, in theory, most of the standards are, from a security perspective, reasonable, um, have reasonable specifications, and it could be done, but there is also, there's always like operational reality. Yeah. And uh, operational reality uh, that uh, kicks, kicks in, and given the complexity, there's all types of trade-offs. And there has been uh, so far 
um, for many decades the thinking of a walled garden, like it's only telcos interacting across specific interfaces, and as history has shown, uh, this assumption might not always be valid. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? And thank you again, and have a great blackout. <laughs>